this thing on? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the last speech for this year's um, Institute on National Affairs. As most of you probably already know, our symposium has in, been entitled Art in America Today, a Public Matter. And I hope all of you have had a chance or an opportunity to get to see the things that have gone on this last week on campus. Um, there are a few things that are still going on that I think are really well worth, no worth mentioning. And, that is two, and these are two different exhibits. One is the Papa John Collection, which is over in the Brunier Gallery at the Schumann Continuing Education Building, and it will be open until February 22nd. And the other one is the Eskimo Art Exhibit, and that's here at the Memorial Union, and it will be um, still up until the end of January. So if you get a chance, I think it'd be well worthwhile to stop by and take a look at it. And for our topic to tonight, it's entitled um, Art and Politics. And our speaker is Charles Christopher Mark. He was born in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He has a BA in English and a master's in social work. He's been related with the arts for quite a while. And some of his past um, positions have been director of the, uh, director of the Arts Council in Winston-Salem, South Carolina. North. He, North, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Found, he, he was founding executive director for the Greater St. Louis Arts Education Council, consultant for the National Foundation of the Arts, special consultant for the arts at the White House, president of the Performing Arts Council of the Music, of the music Center of Los Angeles Cal <coughs> County, and he also has written a book entitled Run Runaway Home. He's presently publisher and editor of the Art Report Reporting Service, and he's also an art commentator for the National Public Radio. So ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you Charles Christopher Mark. <laughs> And my latest activity is Arctic exploring in Iowa. <laughs> it sounds like I can't hold a job, all those things that I've done. <laughs> and it's true. <laughs> um, art and politics is um, a fairly new term, as is cultural policy arts administrators, all these things didn't exist 15, 20 years ago. In fact, I am half of the extant original Arts Council executives. When I became an Arts Council executive down at Winston-Salem in 1958, there were four people in the country who were employed professionally to administer a federated arts program. Of the four, one of them drank himself to death, which is about the right statistical mortality for the field. About 25% meet that fate. Uh, the, another one, his wife had, and he had six daughters, and he was offered a vice presidency, and they were very good Catholics, and he was offered a vice presidency of a Catholic girls' college, which included free tuition. <laughs> <laughs> so he left the field, so another man and I are the only ones who survived, and I think he stayed because nobody, he, nobody else would hire him to do anything. Of course, I had a choice of anything I wanted to do, but I chose this field. <laughs> I was going to fare forward to the end. Uh, the way I got involved in politics and the arts was I got fired in St. Louis at the Arts Council and was looking around for something to do. And uh, a mutual friend asked me if I wanted to come to Washington and work for the Office of Education, the U.S. Office of Education. I said, come on, you know, who wants to do that? That's the dullest thing in the world. But she uh, was in Washington, and Roger Stevens had been appointed as special assistant to President Johnson. 
And uh, they had lunch together one time, and I'd met Roger Stevens. He was then chairman of what was known as the National Cultural Center, which then became the Kennedy Center after Kennedy's tragic death. And now Johnson had appointed him to investigate the possibility of a federal arts program. So he and Kathy had lunch, and she suggested that he needed somebody who knew what was going on in the grassroots movement in the country. And uh, my name Sorry. came. Yes? All right, we have three up here. <laughs> None of them are for speaking. This one should be, the one in the middle. Right there. Yeah. That one's, no, that one's. The only one working? Why are we recording this, I might ask, before I go on? <laughs> what are you going to do with this? <laughs> Who's on the end of this one? I mean, if this is for private use, in your own home, <laughs> and you have permission of the National Football League, it's all right, but <laughs> we're going to broadcast this that tempers what I'm going to say a little bit. I smoke while I talk because I used to live in North Carolina where you were chastised if you didn't smoke while you talked. <laughs> the Reynolds Tobacco executives would take your name. <laughs> Are they working on something? At any rate, I, I wound up in Washington, working in the White House. And I figured that's the place to start if you're going to start a new career. <laughs> and I didn't know anything, and neither did Roger Stevens. And we had to learn from there. And the first assignment I had was to go around the country and see if anybody was interested in the federal arts program. And there was only one burning question at the time. Will we have government control of the arts if we have a government program? And I said, well, I don't really know. I mean, my standard answer was, I don't really know. I've only been in Washington six months. But so far, as far as I can determine, the government doesn't control the government. How are they going to control the arts? <laughs> I mean, the whole thing is a monolith. It moves forward like a giant California slug after a heavy rain, <laughs> leaving st sticky residue behind it. As it, you know, it has no eyes or no, it just moves. Like Doxiatis' concept of a city, you know, when one city becomes a slum, you just move, you know, just click a place where you can move it along in an east-west direction, just keep building new city. That's the way the government operates. It doesn't make any difference who's president, who's in the Congress. It just moves, you know, like a university. <laughs> it exists. It goes. And then, and then I would answer the question with, they'd say, you know, government will control the arts. The, you know, the, I said, give me an example of a very good Republican opera. <laughs> or how about a real Zacco Democratic Symphony? And, you know, they really hadn't, they were fearful of something that couldn't possibly happen because the only ideology, you have to have an ideology in order to have a government control. I mean, Marxism is easy, because Marx says all art must be understandable by the least peasant. So when a composer writes a piece of music, they get an orchestra to play it, they get a bunch of peasants around to listen to it. You like it, you don't like it. You don't like it, forget it. You know, write another one. Can't do this in this country, because there is no Republican art, there's no Democratic art. The only principle we have, the only ideology, is freedom of speech, freedom of expression. So how are you going to... So we control that. You must write a free play, a free book, a free piece of music. It's ridiculous. But still, they were very fearful. Symphony orchestras voted 87%, something like that, trustees, managers, against government support of the arts, lobbied against it. People came to Washington, lobbied against it. Big organizations in the arts. But when they saw that the bill was going to pass, this wonderful country has such high ideals, and you know, top of the list is something called pragmatism. When they knew, <laughs> when they failed and it was going to pass, they said, we never said we were against government support for the arts. <laughs> we decided, we really looked into it now, and we know it's going to be all right, because they wanted a piece of the pie. And so we got it. And we got it, you know, then, I, then I found out there's very strange things going on in Washington about how things get done. For instance, the first bill we got through was to create a uh, national council. See, President Kennedy was a very impatient man, and he didn't 
have the patience to work with the Congress. So there was a bill proposed that there be a National Council on the Arts. And when it came onto the floor of the House, uh, a congressman introduced an amendment that the arts shall include the art of poker playing. And uh, <clears throat> they debated that for a long time. <laughs> not whether or not it was an art form, but whether or not they were including all forms of poker that the members of the House could understand. <laughs> and so they defeated it. And President Kennedy got upset about that, and he said, to hell with them, I'll create one by legislative by executive order. I'll just sign my name and we'll create an advisory council by executive order. And this was just at the point when he, where he was killed. And so when President Johnson came in, uh, he eventually got around to these unexecuted executive orders. And whether it's apocryphal or factual, I don't know. But it's been quoted to me that he looked at this, read the bill, and he said, no. This is the kind of thing that if the people don't do it, it isn't worth a damn. He says, get me somebody who can get this through if that's what we want. And Roger Stevens came on the scene, and of course, he got it done. This was an advisory uh, council only. And the way that Roger Stevens got it done was he had a secretary who had a boyfriend, <laughs> and they went on a date. And she came in one morning, and she said, you know, that bill that we're trying to get out of, out of Judge Smith's committee, who was then chairman of the Rules Committee, I think he died hope. Uh, at least he's not chairman anymore. Uh, my boyfriend says that Judge Smith is a very good friend of a certain banker in Washington, and uh, that if he'll do whatever this banker tells him to. So Roger Stevens went over to this bank where he was doing some real estate dealings from time to time and chatted to this banker about a loan for a certain project that he was trying to get through in Washington, which was sheer, he didn't intend to do this, but you know, it gave him an entree. And then he said, by the way, I've got this little bill in Congress that I'm, the president is anxious about, and it's held up in Judge Smith's Rules Committee. And uh, it's really harmless, it's only 50,000 a year, but it would do a lot of good for the arts and blah, blah, blah. And the banker says, oh, I'll talk to Howard. And he picked up the phone, he talked to Howard. The next day, next day the bill came out of committee. So you see how the wonderful civic progress of manifestations of democracy go inexorably forward based on such a, <laughs> oh, now do I hold that? I feel like Andy Williams here. <laughs> I want to hold it, it's up to you. Is that not going to interfere with them? Well, you won't tell me what you're going to take it for anyway, aren't you? How's that? There we go. I think I should shave. <laughs> Is this better? Yeah. Oh, boy. So it was, it's, it's that kind of thing that often gets things done in Washington because your secretary's boyfriend knows somebody who knows somebody. So we got that bill through. And then we got the, the, the snowball rolling, and we got the endowment bill through. Now, the endowment, uh, you know, we had a lot of trouble with the humanities people, for instance. The humanities people came to Washington to testify for the arts and humanities bill, and their strategy was to throw out what had been proposed and go in there and make a big case for having a humanities endowment which included the arts under it. And within 12 hours, it's amazing how all these academicians changed their mind, all these scholars changed their mind, because a certain congressman sat down with them and said, if you go in there and give that testimony, there isn't going to be a humanities bill, there isn't going to be an arts bill. And so they had to rewrite their testimony. Just, you know, <laughs> big, you do it. Raw power. Uh, another thing was, another thing about the inside of the, you know, how things get done in Washington, Larry O'Brien at that time was, uh, LBJ's legislative man, and you know the, his Congress watcher. I remember Saturday morning we were all sitting around there, Senator Pell and Livingston Biddle, who was now the chairman of the National Endowment, was an assistant to, to Pell at that time, and uh, Congressman Thompson and his aide, and Roger Stevens and I, and we were talking about whether we should push in this session and what we should push for and exactly what kind of legislation the Congress would hold still for. And Larry O'Brien sat there and listened, and then he reached into his pocket like this, 
And here's a piece of paper that he carried with him at all times, and it had the name, members of the House and the members of the Senate. And he said, well, let me see now. He said, uh, Art's bill only. Oh, let me see. So, so, yes, 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 no. Yeah, well, his wife paints. <laughs> he was an English major. He's not a very good congressman, but he's an English major. And he went right down the aisle, went right down his list, and, was, and made an assumption about everybody in the Congress, the Senate, and the House. I said, Arts bill, eh. This is humanities bill only. No. Arts and humanities will have done list again. And that's why we have an arts and humanities in Dominic. <laughs> <laughs> At a UNESCO meeting some time later, I told the Frenchman that story about how it was done. And, you know, mon dieu! <laughs> it so offended the, Gal the Gallic sense of logic, you know. He says, we planned for five years before we put forth the bill to create the Maison de Couture, you know. I said, well, now we have just a half an hour and <laughs> Larry O'Brien's office could have saved all that time for you. <laughs> uh, we planned things, you know, right from the top. <laughs> So we got a, you know, we got the arts bill through in the form that we got it through. The same was the reason there was a state arts council provision in the bill was not because there had been any long-term planning to create a state arts council. I mean, it was a social movement and a, and a deeply thought-out concept of cultural progress. That was in there because that was the price of Senator Javits' support. He represented one of the few states that had a state arts council at the time. And Senator Javits is a liberal Republican, and we knew we could never get it through without the support of the liberal Republicans, and we never would have. Without Javits in the Senate, and uh, I forget the uh, Freeling Housing in the, in the House, uh, leading the Republicans, the liberal Republicans, to vote with the Democrats, because we lost the conservative Democrats, and you can't get the conservative Republicans. Yeah. Something like this. They were, they were out to lunch. But that's how we squeaked the thing through. And, one, and the leader of the opposition in the House was a man named Gerald Ford. He was right in there, fighting against us, right until the time that uh, Nixon became president. And Nixon came, said, don't do that no more, Gerald. And he said, OK, I won't do that no more. <laughs> and he, he went right down the party line. The only time we stopped him in his tracks was the time we got an editorial on, on how good the arts were from the Detroit Free Press just the day before our bill came to the House floor. And it actually came to the, the editorial. Actually, we were shoved in front of him while he was just getting up from his seat. And he looked down. <laughs> so I learned about politics fast. In a hurry, so we got, so we got the bill passed, right? And we looked. Roger Stevens and I looked at each other. We said, "Now what do we do?" We didn't know. We had absolutely no idea. How do you create a federal agency? There is no me mechanism. The federal government has been in business for 200 years. Has created hundreds of federal agencies, and there's no agency on agencies, <laughs> or even any thing they're supposed to be. There's something in the Bureau of the Budget, but everybody told me, don't go near them, because they'll, they'll screw it up for you. Set it up the way you want, then go to them for approval. I said, how do you set up a federal agency? And Roger Stevens said, well, he said, I got a real estate deal in New York, and he said, I got a couple of places I want to look at. And he says, yeah, get the thing started. I'll be back in a few days. <laughs> and there I sat, and, and you know, just as you're sitting here today, that's, I knew as much as you do right now about it. And I got to to buttonholing people on the bus in the morning. That's it. You work for the government? <laughs> Who do you work for? You know, you say, uh, Science and Technology Council. Oh, good, good, council. That's like us. We've got a council. <laughs> Who's your boss? You know. And that's the way I was doing it. <laughs> and one thing led to another, of course. I got better at it. I, uh, um, but the thing I had going, I was telling this class, I was telling this, the thing that you have, the most beautiful weapon you can have, a tool in this whole country, is to have the white, is to work in the White House. Because I had the stationery and I had the phones. And you can talk to anybody in the world and they will talk to you. If they pick up that phone and say hello and somebody says, the White House is calling, will you hold please? Move! <laughs> <laughs 
they'll sit there for the rest of their lives. <laughs> because they don't know who the hell's going to come out of it. They all have this secret belief that it's the president. <laughs> Or somebody, and particularly if somebody's working for the government, way down the line someplace. And you know, the White House is calling. He has never seen the White House. You know, he came there to work for agriculture. They took him out to the northwest part of Washington. He's been there ever since. And boy, the White House is on the line. You know, it's, it's somebody. So I could get to see anybody and pick their brains, and, and I, it was ruthless. I'd say, well, now, I thought you could help me with some of the legal problems the agency started. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Well, uh, we could use some help. Uh, you don't happen to have a lawyer that uh, you could assign to us to take care of legal. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Just take my assistant. My, my, no, he's my cousin. Right? <laughs> because all this accrued brownie points to them and to their agency, and they're very eager to do this. So by that method, I managed to get things started and picking the brains of people who knew. I went to the Office of Education, and I stole an administrative officer, got him on assigned leave. They were paying his salary. Because you know, we didn't know, first of all, how do you, you know, we didn't know how to get any money. The Congress said they shall have so much money. I said, well, how do we get this? Well, you have to ask for an appropriation. I said, how do you ask for an appropriation? That's not our department. <laughs> We're the Bureau of the Budget. Once the budget leaves us, that goes up to the Hill, that's a different, you know, separation of powers. That's the legislative branch. You have to ask them. I said, but aren't they my enemies, my adversaries? They said, yes, they are. <laughs> So are they going to tell me how to do this? They said, well, I don't know. That's not our department. You know, nobody, ever, nobody in the government ever says yes, you know, because you don't get promoted for saying yes. You get promoted for saying no, because that's how you keep things the way they always are. Can I do this? Let me see. Mm, no. <laughs> it's not on the list, no. I, I learned this. Two, two, a phrase that you always have to use is, what is the language and procedure? Because they always want to tell you the way they do it, but that has nothing to do with the language and the procedure the way the law is written and the way the federal regulations are. You know, it's so much of it is it's custom and myth, and, and it's always super cautious. You can get to the language and the procedure, you can find out what kind of latitude you have, and it's always broader than what they'll tell you to your threats. So I went to uh, borrow people from all over, and I got them. But then there's a strange procedure in the government. You see, you have to have civil service permission to hire people, right? Because the whole government is, the spoil system is all went out with Garfield, remember? And now we have civil service, which says you have to get approval from the Civil Service Commission to create a position. Fine. Okay. Go over civil service. Here are the forms. You can create a position. I read the forms. Now I want to, let me see, it says name of position, uh, legal counsel. Job description, I had to take care of legal things. You know. <laughs> I fill out all the form and I get to the bottom of the form. And it says, this form must be signed by, there's a blank, on one side it says, the legal counsel. <laughs> <laughs> on the other side it says, the administrative officer. And then down below it says, chairman of the agency. Charles C. Mark, legal counsel. <laughs> <laughs> Gave it to Roger Stevens, he signed it as chairman. And I wrote on the other side, Charles C. Mark, administrative officer. <laughs> signed it to civil service, they gave us a legal counsel. All together. <laughs> and this goes for stationery, you know, everything you have to, somebody has to sign it. And, I, and my rank at the time was, con was consultant to the arts, which has nothing in the government. That's a bad word to be, because that means you have no responsibility. You are a consultant, you have no authority whatsoever. Altogether, I signed 523 illegal documents <laughs> by this method, which the General Services Administration, no, the GAO, the General Accounting Office, which belongs to the Congress and investigates whatever you tell them to investigate if you're a congressman. They'll investigate your grandmother's varicose veins if a congressman <laughs> says you have to do that. So they march into their office after about six months of operation, and they said, Mr. Mark, you signed 523 illegal documents. Yes, what else is new? <laughs> I said, that's terrible. That's a, that's a federal crime. And I said, I don't doubt it. <laughs> and they said, what are you going to do, uh, what are you going to do about it? I said, no, what I'm going to do about it. I'm going to forget about it. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> and they said, we're going to charge you with signing 523 legal, illegal documents. I said, well, would you come back later? I'm busy. I'm very busy. <laughs> and they said, uh, you'll have to give testimony. I said, I'll be happy to give testimony. And they said, you know, and they called me and they said, can you come over? I said, no, I can't come over. You come over here. 
Because by this time I had rank. See? I had power. I had been appointed by the president to a super grade. Now they weren't going to fool with me. <laughs> Good thing I wasn't a consultant. They would have put me in irons. So I made them come over there, and they came over with a, star, uh, a court reporter. And these two guys sat there with this big, st and literally the stack was this high. And they intended to go through every single one of those documents that I had signed and ask me questions about them, why I signed them, when I signed them, was I aware that I signed them illegally, et cetera, et cetera. And so I began giving them the same answer for every question. Yes, I signed them. I don't, know when, I don't remember when I signed it. Why did I sign it? I signed it because of a matter of expedience to get the agency started. There was nobody else to do it. And they said, do you intend to give the same answer for all this, these, these questions on all these documents? I said, do you intend to ask the same questions? I intend to give the same answers. I've been here all day. And they said, well, can we assume you will give these answers? I said, I swear to God I'm going to give those answers. They said, get the hell out of here. I don't want But they were, they, this, is, this is all procedure, you know. This is all very, very serious to them. And then they, they, they went away, and they were going to make a determination as what to be done about me, what could be done about me. They came back after about a month, and they said, we have decided that all those documents must be re redrawn and signed by the proper person. I said, you understand that at the time, they, I mean, you want to date them at, at the original date? Yes. I said, you understand that if you do that, you're having people sign them who weren't even existing at the time the documents were drawn. Like the legal counsel didn't get hired until two months after I signed the illegally legal counsel. They said, we're aware of that. So that's what they did. <laughs> we had to type up all those documents and have the right people sign them. And then I got back to work. <laughs> and that's the kind of uh, thing that you go through on the bureaucratic side in Washington. On the, on the legislative side, um, became aware going into Congress for the first time, first time to testify before a committee, uh, something that was very important to learn, that the committees are your adversary until they mark up a bill, what they call mark up a bill, and then they become your advocates. And if you can keep that in mind, you can keep your temper about you, because they are, these are experts. You know, they were all lawyers in the first place, I think prosecuting attorneys who specialize in prosecuting pimps or something. <laughs> They're so mean as cross-examiners, but you have to realize that when, they, when that bill goes on the floor, they are the ones that are going to have to protect you and defend you, because they say, this is what this agency is entitled to, it, and, that, and you know, by God, they're going to get it. And they then, among their colleagues, have to defend you. So that's why they ask you all these hard questions, but they're so good at it. You know, they lead you down the garden path. You know, you know how about this? How about this? How about this? Then how do you account for this? <laughs> mm. <laughs> it was a mistake. <laughs> I didn't get much sleep the night before. <laughs> but you have to defend yourself, and they're really very fair with you, and they were very fair with us, except one Republican from Virginia. He never, he used to ask us for all kinds of favors. He'd ask us for Broadway tickets and opera tickets and and uh, could we do this and could we do that? And then we'd give it to him and we'd say, are you going to vote for us? He'd say, no! <laughs> when, we, when we saw us up in the, in the gallery of the, of the house, he'd wave to us a big smile. And, oh, it's, it's wonderful. You guys are such a wonderful thing. And he'd say, how do you vote? No! <laughs> you know. But the rest of them were, were fairly nice people. And I really came to believe, after all this experience, first of all, I came to believe I didn't want to be a congressman. I had you know, like everybody comes to Washington, you know, maybe someday I could. I, I was disabused of that dream, and I saw how hard they have to work and how much they are at the mercy of their constituents and the political pressures. I had just a miserable job. And if you think congressmen, you know, have a soft life, they do not. Senators, yes. Supreme Court justices, of course. But congressmen, no, no way. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Mondale's brother, Vice President Mondale's brother, is a longtime friend of mine and their families. And um, so we would be over at Pete and Ginny Mondale's frequently when uh, Fritz's children would be over there playing. And their good friends were Congressman Quee's children, who was a congressman from Minnesota. And I remember one year was an election year, and the, the children of Fritz Mondale weren't even sure who he was running against. 
and the children of Congressman Cleese knew everything about you know, the whole election and the procedure and, and how tough it was going to be and how their father was doing in the polls. And then I asked one of them, I said, will you be glad when the election's over? And they said, yeah, we'll be so glad because we'll have six months before we have to campaign again. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it is a way of life to the, to the congressman and his whole family to be a congressman. But um, that was one thing I got disabused of was political ambitions. And the other thing, I really came to respect and understand that the, the congressmen do and the, and the senators do exactly as you tell them. And there's no question about this. And I don't mean you just write a postcard and say, I like Ike. Uh, but they respond to any kind of re uh, opinion that you have on any issue that's before them. And, that, you know, and they all say that, and it all sounds like a, a, cr a cliche that, that doesn't uh, really have any weight, but they certainly do. They read that mail, they listen to those polls, they, they react according, and you get the, exactly the kind of government that you, you deserve if you don't open your mouth on gun control and the, the pro-gun people do, that's the way it's going to go. And I really came to respect that, that aspect of, of this great government. Mm -hmm. And it does respond. And that's what it's all about. And you cannot force these men to take a position on something that the people back home don't want. They like being congressmen. And they like to continue being congressmen. And that means they've got to get the votes and they've got to read pretty accurately what you people want. And they want to hear. And I don't know um, what else there is to say about art and politics, except you want more art support, you've got to get in there and fight for it at the state level and at the, at the national level. Story about how Iowa got an arts council. I mean, then. Right after the bill passed and the agency was set up and we hired a few people illegally, <laughs> uh, my next assignment was to take care of that state arts council business. I'm going to New York. my community organization techniques from health and welfare and I dealt with governors and, and speakers in the house by conning them one way or the other. You know, I'd say to South Carolina, I'd say, you know, Georgia and North Carolina are going to have arts council and you're going to look like a fool, a foolish state, backward state, not there in the middle and that would help you know, get the arts council. Then I'd go to North, then I'd go to North Carolina and say, you know, South Carolina is going to have it. <laughs> South Carolina is going to have it. North Carolina is going to have it. You know, this kind of thing. And I had pretty much all the states lined up. Nobody believed that the state legislators would ever vote our state arts council. That was, you know, they couldn't get it through the Congress. How are they going to get it through North Dakota? You know, everybody in Washington was saying. Everybody in the East was saying. But I was persistent, and I kept. I flew about three hundred thousand miles in fifteen months. Just constantly lived on airplanes. I would be swimming in Hawaii on, at noon and drying my swimming suit over a hot wood stove in Fairbanks, Alaska, at midnight. And I never would find out what time it is because you keep losing time all the time. This jet lag wasn't known as well as it is now, and I can testify that it really exists. I never did. I, uh, I swear I lost 12 hours someplace, and I never caught up. So I'm like, there's 12 hours missing out of my life, and I'm going to find it. <laughs> if I have to fly around the world twice to catch up. Uh, but Iowa was sticky. Iowa was sticky. I, could, I don't know who's going. I forget. Maybe Hughes. I couldn't crack him, and I couldn't crack the, the speaker of the house, and I I couldn't get any place, and I'd been back once or twice. I was going to come back one more time and just tell them that every state has got it now except you and I forget what other state, I know, Wyoming, <coughs> Arizona, or someplace, you know, some backward state, not good Midwestern state. You've had my respect all my life. I'm from Wisconsin. Why don't you get with it, you know? That was the only appeal I had. I happened to meet a fellow in the airport who was picking up somebody, and he was working in the state at the time. And I knew him from Wisconsin. And he had just done a survey that, that showed that the graduates of the universities in Iowa tended to leave Iowa after graduation. Something like four years after that, there were only 20% of them left in the state or something like that. And I thought that was a very salient argument. So I went to the governor and I 
making my point, and I said, I understand that Iowans are leaving wholesale after they get the university education. He says, how'd you find that out? <laughs> and I really couldn't tell him that I met a guy at an airport <laughs> that I used to, used to do plays with in Wisconsin. And I said, well, I understand there was a survey done, and uh, that was the results of it. And he says, yes, and we're not making it public, and for very good reason, because it's costing $50,000 to educate one of these kids at State University, and then they're leaving. I'm uh, we're just ignoring the whole thing. I said, well, maybe one of the reasons they're learning is you're taking them out of these small towns, bringing them to Ames and Iowa City, having these wonderful concert programs, teaching them art appreciation, music appreciation, theater appreciation, dance appreciation, appreciation, appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're educating them this way for four years, getting them used to the finer things in life, and the appetite grows with the eating, and then you're saying to them, now you go right back down there to Boone, Iowa, and you run your father's business or your father's farm, and you just forget about all you learned. I said, you think maybe that's one of the reasons why they're fleeing to those such cultural capitals as Milwaukee? <laughs> <laughs> and so he said, I will have an arts council in this state if it can be attached to the university, because that makes good sense to me. I said, you know, you close the university to have an arts council. I thought that was a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> or stop teaching art, stop teaching theater, stop teaching these things, because you're, make, you're only making unhappy islands. And what this country doesn't need is any more unhappy islands. <laughs> you're unhappy enough without that education. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and on the basis of that, the governor you know, backed it, and, you, and the first arts council, is it still attached to the university? Is it still official uh, outside the university? That was the only one in the, and he said, would you recognize such a thing? I said, I'll recognize anything, you know, because I had to go to the Congress and say, I, you know, I've got an arts council in every state, now give me the money, which was only two and a half million dollars, something like that at the time. But I was bound and determined that the first year that the state arts councils could have money, I was going to come in there and have, if not all of them, damn near all of them, organized. And we did, and we all got started. But <coughs> such things I used to do to lie to the Congress in the United States, yes, um, but North Dakota, yes, they have an ice concert. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> it did pass the legislature, but the governor vetoed it. <laughs> what did you say? I said, uh, it's getting cold here. <laughs> uh, and again, it was a matter of, of you know, the right people in the right place. And uh, the kind of pressure that you could build up at the grassroots level it came right from the bottom. That, that did it in every case. First year, we got two and a half million dollars for the whole National Endowment for the Arts. This year, President Carter proposed 150 million dollars. And that's not adequate. Because the need is so great. In, you know, <coughs> as the, as the, as the, and the arts endowment is more aware of all of the arts activity that's going on in this country. We start out with a staff of uh, 15 or 20, and now the staff is 150. And uh, the people discovered the arts uh, endowment you know, gradually and slowly. We didn't encourage them. We tried to keep it a secret as much as possible. It's amazing how people find out about these things and what they want, you know. People would show up in the office saying, well, I've been a music instructor here in Boise, Idaho for a long time now, and I've always wanted to have my own orchestra, and now that my government, which I love so greatly, oh, that government, I love it, is having a lot of money for arts, I thought you'd give me that orchestra because it would do a lot of good in Boise. <laughs> and I brought a suitcase along that's empty to take the money back. <laughs> I mean, practically that kind of proposal. Certainly we got them in the mail, if not in person. But um, I think what, it hap what, what has happened, I made the statement, I, I, I've done it. No. I don't think that we did anything that was remarkable, that's what I'm saying. I don't think President Johnson did anything except perceptively read uh, 
as politicians somehow ma manage to do, as artists somehow manage to do, but politicians do it with the general population, and artists do it with the truth that they are involved in. Uh, he read that the country was ready for it, and I think the congressmen and senators read it in the same way. And I think they were just acting out the will of the people at the time uh, when they passed this arts legislation. And the same with the states. Because something happened to this country after World War II that caused it to suddenly turn to the arts in greater and greater, ever accelerating degrees. I think uh, the experience of the war, the bloodbath that we all experienced, we went off and we had our friends killed, and we saw cities destroyed, innocent people killed. We wanted to do something creative and constructive rather than destructive. I think that's a kind of natural reaction in general after wars. I think that education, uh, the GI Bill, I certainly would never have gone to college without the GI Bill. My family wasn't too happy that I went to high school. Uh, I did it you know, under there, and I certainly would have never been exposed to the arts. The day that I got off the bus in Madison, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven when I realized these were 26,000 students, people, not students, I just thought they were people that had nothing to do but learn. It was just a whole new world. I never went back to Milwaukee after that. Uh, and I think there were millions like me who had this experience as young men. And then we saw cultures, though we were blowing up their cities. Uh, at the same time, we saw what people valued and kept and uh, preserved over centuries and centuries. I think that had an impact on us. And we had the population basket upset when everybody moved from New York to Iowa, and from Iowa to California, and from California to Arizona, thinking they were getting greener grass, and the great influx of, of immigrants from Europe. Uh, and it was the first time in the history of this country that we got the best instead of the worst. We, instead of getting the immigrants that couldn't make it as peasants in, in, in Europe, as uh, our forefathers, mine included, uh, suddenly, were the these were the intellectuals and the educated people who were being thrown out of the, of the European countries, and they moved all over the country. I remember Winston Salem had never Winston Salem had never had a foreign, <coughs> foreign film until 1955. They'd never seen a foreign film until 1955 when a man named um, what's his name Frank Corti, who was a German chemist, who had been thrown out of 14 countries before he got to this one, I and mean, he, he fled the Nazis because he was Jewish, and he went to Switzerland, then he got into Italy, then he got through Italy, and smuggled through Italy, and then Portugal, Spain, South America, Cuba. Finally, he bought a false passport in Cuba and got in the United States. And he says, those Cubans, they're so dumb. <laughs> $50 for a false passport. <laughs> be an American citizen for $50. It's better than being an American citizen if you can just buy it like that. So, and the way he learned all these languages, where he, in these countries where he had to hide in, was by going to movies. So he saw every movie ever made. And he organized a film friends society. Film friends, he called it. Film friends society in Winston-Salem, which just set the whole town on fire. They'd never seen these things. Yeah. Uh, and this was happening all over the country. And, and as they say, the appetite grows with the eating. And it just started to move. And then they weren't satisfied with Warmed Over Broadway. and started the, own, uh, the, the theaters that started, started doing their own plays. Uh, and that's very recent. I mean, mid-60s, I was going all over in the country. I, you know, I, I'd come to a town and they'd say, oh, it's so good to have you here. We'd like you to see our little, our, our new rep prof professional theater. We, so if you don't mind, we'll go straight there. You can eat afterwards. And they're doing the Caucasian Chalk Circle. And I'd say, oh, wonderful. <laughs> I haven't seen the Caucasian Chalk Circle since last week. <laughs> you know, they were all doing what Alan Schneider used to say, the 26 varieties of, of, uh, of Bertolt Brecht and others all over the country. I mean, that was the wave. If I saw Waiting for Godot one more time, I was going to scream, or, oh, dad, poor dad. They were all doing these kinds of plays uh, and doing well at it because they were bringing that kind of theater to, t to cities that had never seen it. But then in the last 10 years, we've had uh, suddenly a, uh, somebody started doing new plays, and now we're seeing a lot of new plays in the theaters. And the same thing is happening in the museums and in all the fields. And it's, I think we're going to go back to a regional kind of art. 
that uh, was a movement that started in the 20s and 30s and, and fell flat on its face because there wasn't the kind of artistic confidence on the part of the artists that was required. The only thing that ever came out of it was the outdoor dramas of North Carolina and a Pulitzer Prize to, uh, what's his name, Green for, um, Paul Green for, um, uh, what was a play? When he won the Pulitzer Prize, the Green in My Path or something. Well, anyway, that, that's, that's about all that happened out of the Drummond Green, Robert Gard uh, movement in regional, regional arts at that time. But I think we're coming back to this now. Where artists are learning to say, no, I don't want to go to New York. I want to stay here. I want to work here. And uh, they're moving out of New York to the, to the regions and are happier for it and more productive and more creative. And there's no longer the barrier. If you're good, you're good all over. Uh, there's no longer a stigma to being good in Kankakee uh, and not good in New York, whether it's creative or performing artist. And that's all happened just since 1945, 1948, that the arts had changed and they have gotten politically astute. Um, so, questions? Answers? <laughs> Disagreements? We still have a lot of time. Who? Sir. Uh, 